Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Andy Schmidt, the founder of Comics Experience. Andy, welcome to Comic Culture. Thanks for having me. So uh, before you founded Comics Experience, you were an editor at Marvel and IDW Comics. And I'm wondering how you go from uh, what's essentially a high profile career uh, at the, you know, some of the bigger publishers to developing a website and, uh, and I guess uh, a place where comic creators can learn the craft. Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think it came from a lot of my own experiences. Um, I had, uh, prior to, to working at Marvel, I had gotten a master's degree in communications uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, and um, and I was teaching. I was an adjunct professor at a at a, at a couple of colleges there, and um, and I loved I loved teaching. I've always loved teaching, and and for a while I was thinking that was going to be my career. That that was really that was really where I was headed um, when the Marvel job came along. Um, so I took the Marvel job, but that didn't mean that I stopped loving teaching. And so I took a keen interest as a as an editor at Marvel in trying to help develop new talent. I mean, you get a flood of emails, you get a flood of uh, portfolios to review, you're, you're constantly getting pitches. Uh, and I did my best to get back to as many people as I could. And, I, you know, unfortunately, the answer is usually no, not right now. But I tried to give like a little bit of feedback of you know, maybe work on this or, Hey, I, I, I responded to this. It doesn't fit right now. Maybe we'll, maybe I'll, you know, come see me at a convention if you're going to be there or something. So I tried to give some, some feedback, maybe a word of encouragement or two, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, it was always important to me trying to help develop new talent and bring people in. Um, it was often hard to do that because you have the weight of actually trying to get books out the door, you know, there's a deadline every week. So, um, when I was leaving Marvel, I left because my wife and I were having our first child, and um, uh, lo and behold, she graduated with a degree in math and economics and managed to make significantly more money than I did editing funny books. Um, so I was going to be the stay-at-home dad, and I was. for. And, um, and when I left, I thought, well, I'll have my nights not free necessarily, but I'll, I'll be able to work some at night, and so what do I want to do? And so so I, I essentially combined my two my two career aspirations of comics and education uh, and, and love of, of teaching. And I realized that that not only what did I want to combine those two things, but that that didn't really exist in the way that I, I would have liked when I was trying to break in. So my litmus test for all the courses and the workshop and everything is, would this be something I would have wanted or needed when I was trying to break into the to the comics industry, um, and so that's sort of the the spine of of what I built Comics Experience around. And so I started it in 2007, and as a very small business, and then then I went to IDW. So so in between Marvel and and IDW as editors there, I started Comics Experience. And so when I was at IDW, I'd come home at night you know, have dinner, play with the kids, put the kids to bed, and then work on comics experience. And it just kind of grew very organically over time until it was something I could do pretty much full time now, which is which is kind of awesome and not what I expected, but I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the website is, is really interesting because uh, I did a, a search today at, at comicsexperience.com and I've got to say that the courses you offer are from uh, somebody who might be interested in, in beginning, you know, how do I kind of get my foot in the door, all the way up to uh, advanced techniques in coloring or lettering or, or uh, you know, writing. So um, you've also been able to attract a lot of industry professionals to come in and serve as mentors and, and teach some classes. So um, how are you able to get them involved in a, a, product, a project like this? Um. Well, certainly I had a lot of professional contacts from being an editor. When you're the guy doling out the paycheck that, you know, you, you tend to get, uh, you tend to make friends fairly, fairly easily unless you, you know, don't dole out the paycheck, but I did. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, I, when I was at Marvel, my office, not me alone, but the office I was a part of, there were three or four editors at any given time working in there, but we all kind of worked on everything together. Um, 
and we were putting out 18, 19 comics a month. And each comic we put out had its own creative team that I interacted with. So the exposure to the number of creators and the friendships that I had just very naturally accrued very quickly over time. So I really had a wealth of contacts to to reach out to people. So what I started to do was look at, you know, who did I enjoy working with? Like, who did I feel personally like that that they were really good good people and that they had they had a love of comics as a medium. I was looking. For, I wanted to make sure that they could teach. That was really important because not just because they're good at something doesn't mean that. Um, and I wanted to make sure that they were, you know, going to be sort of good ambassadors of of comics and and of teaching so so that was kind of the criteria i use is i look for you know skilled people with with name recognition with industry credentials um that are still working in the industry and and good people that that can teach that's been a fairly fairly solid combination you know i'm looking i'm looking for the the instructors that a big name creator who can't teach very well or isn't that interested in it isn't really what i'm interested in um yeah i'm looking for i'm looking for more substance than than flash now it's interesting because um i guess in the old days maybe 20 years ago you might have a correspondence course i remember uh, the old cartoon uh ad um you would draw the turtle send it in and you could you know get a correspondence course in art or something like that um, but this is different because you're able to interact with your students. So I'm wondering uh, how you use uh, sort of what we're doing, uh, the, the video chat, to uh, mentor uh, your students. Yeah, uh, a couple of different ways. Um, but the main one is for the courses, you know, the courses and, and then in the creator's workshop, which is a little different. The creator, a course, you know, we meet online and for two hours a week for a set number of weeks. And there are assignments that, that you get each week and, and you post those and they get reviewed. It's very, it's structured very much like a, like a traditional uh, classroom. Um, the Creators Workshop is, is a 24 seven, you know, private online for message board forum. And we have live workshops, uh, a couple of them a month, you know, where we drill down on specific topics. We did one uh, this week on on page turns, how to create page turns, why we create page turns and that kind of thing. Um, I did one just the week before on how to write for a particular artist, how to play, how to script to play, play to an artist. So, so those are real kind of like drill down. We get a couple of those. Uh, we do a couple of those every month. <clears throat> But for the courses, when it's a, it's the same group of you know maybe ten to fifteen students um, in there, you know we, there's a chat uh, box over there, so you can communicate with chat. They can kind of talk with each other without interrupting a speaker, whether it's me or somebody else. Um, and I can bring up anything. I can share my desktop, or I can share a share a screen uh, or an application, and art i can draw over the art i can zoom in on the art so i can i can use a lot of different interface tools but and the students can see me uh as i'm talking and they can you know i can i can make one of them a presenter if they want to show something that that they've got um so there's a lot of different tools that i use and then i'm also recording the session so that if there's somebody in the class that can't make it live um because we we've got students on six of our our seven continents so far I, I keep trying to find somebody in antarctica to take the class just to tick that last one off the list but um but uh you know so not everybody can you know we're clearly not in the same time live so i record those and make the the recordings available uh just for the folks in the class and then each class each course of students and myself or or whatever uh, has a private message board just for that class. And so that's where the homework is posted, any follow-up questions would get posted, and so I can interact throughout the week uh, between, the, between the classes on there, and they can, they can interact with each other. So, um, you know, a, a solid class will real bond. A lot of times, um, for example, my intro to writing comics class, a lot of times, you know, a, a large portion of that class, more than half the class may get together and publish an anthology comic based on the scripts that they do in the in the class and that's always you know i encourage people to to do that to pull their resources and and start getting their 
maybe not necessarily their, their careers. Not everybody that comes in wants to make a career in comics, but, you know, start making their comic book journey move further, you know, make a dream come true, have a printed comic with your name on it, you know, in your hand. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool thing. Now, I did also see on uh, your website that some of your um, students have put together uh, comics that you've been able to get published through IDW, and I'm wondering uh, how you were able to work that out. Yeah, so uh, the original uh, print deal with IDW was uh, four titles, and, and and you know I had I had worked at IDW, so I know those guys. <laughs> so I went to them and and asked if they'd be taking a look at at some projects and and what the terms of the deal would be and and, and creators to see if they'd be interested and and um, and and so we did the the four titles and then uh, and then. Then I did some. We published some books digitally that were on Comicsology. We did four more digitally, um, and we are about to announce a new publishing deal with a new with a new publisher. So, um, basically, I just I like talking to people in the industry, and so I'll talk to folks. And if we get along well, and I feel that they're trustworthy, I mean, there are a lot of horror stories in the comics industry. A lot of the the creators I've worked with in the workshop and in courses, they've got some horror stories about dealing with particular publishers or, you know, somebody that they thought was a good person that, that, or, or what have you. But, um, so it's really important to me that if, you know, if comics experience or me personally, if I'm vouching for somebody or for a publisher, it's really important that I find somebody that's on the up and up, that's going to be honest, it's going to keep good records for their books and pay out on time and, and, uh, and really be a good, good partner, help promote the books, help sell, help sell the books. So I'm really, really excited. The IDW deal was very exciting and I'm grateful that we did it. And I think we learned a lot lessons, um, a lot of really valuable stuff. And it was, and, and, the, and the books did well surprisingly well actually and um and i think with our with our new publishing partner i think we're going to do even even better which is which is a really exciting next step now if i were interested in taking courses uh through comics experience do i have to fill out some sort of application do i have to submit samples to get accepted into the the courses or is this uh something where you just kind of have a rapport with somebody and you take them in uh no, if you're if you want to sign up for class, I mean, um, all of our introductory classes, which are usually called introduction to such and such a topic, they're for anyone. So if if you sign up for the class um, and you, you're you know, they, we we fill them up and then they then they close. Um, but uh, but they are built. They are designed for beginners to to people with experience with comics. But I've had I've had a class where I literally had somebody who had never read a comic all the way up to somebody who was working as a comics writing professional. And, you know, most people were, you know, somewhere in between the two zones, but I had both of those in one class. And I was really nervous when, when I realized that that's a pretty wide gamut. How do I make this interesting for, for, for the, the two extremes? Um, but, you know, so for the working professional, some of the stuff that was kind of refresher, for for uh, for her, uh, somebody else. But then we still used to go into some concepts that the professional had gone through, and so I was I was really excited when I wound up getting testimonials from from both of those people saying that they really got a lot of value out of the class and learned a lot, and um, and it's good. I mean, you know, sometimes you know for a professional, just refreshing those those skills. Um, and I know I talk about some things that aren't taught in other places. Um, but, but having somebody kind of look over and, 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 and get you back into that mindset of, of really focusing on character or focusing on this aspect of storytelling. Uh, I, I know it happens to me, happens to me kind of in reverse because sometimes my students will bring up something, um, that maybe I, I didn't cover in great depth and, and then we'll wind up going into it. Actually, the class I taught Last night, I we wound up talking about um, um, telling, you know, writing your scripts in a way where you're where you're incorporating the fact that it's a printed comic. So you're using graphic elements and and outside of just so and so, so and so, you know. Um, and as we were getting into that and talking about it, it dawned on me that there's a script that I'm I'm writing right now that 
there was a treatment that I needed to go use on that. So actually this morning I did uh, I was doing a rewrite on a script um, incorporating some of those things. So I get just as inspired sometimes and I get reminded of like, why didn't I think of that before? Like I know this stuff, but just I hadn't done that in a while. So, so I find that the way the courses are structured and, and the material that we cover goes deep enough that it covers that, that gamut. But we definitely, you know, extend that olive branch. If you want to try your hand at comics, if there's some of the comics that interest you, we want you to come in and, and, and give it a try. And maybe at the end you'll say, Hey, the, it's not the way I thought it was going to be, or it's harder than I thought or whatever. But, but by the end of the course, you should, you know, I, I think there's a, a high probability that you'll think that the, it was, you know, it was worth the price of admission. And you had mentioned before we started recording that um, you're working on uh, a book about comic writing, and um, you said that it should be published sometime in 2018. Can you tell us a, a little bit about what, what the book might entail? Sure. Um, yeah, it should be published in June next year, uh, in 2018, and it's called, uh, it's published by Impact Books, and it's called The Comics Experience Guide to Writing Comics. So I had, I had written a book for them Right, right after I left Marvel, I'd written a book um, called. Actually, am I on video on this? We can are. I show stuff. You can, can show stuff. Up That'd be great. Cameras? Okay, I can. We, do. we love visuals. Okay, yeah. So the first book, I, the first book I did is this one. Um, it's called The Insider's Guide to uh, Creating Comics and Graphic Novels. And it's an overview um, from from writing to the end. You know, through art coloring, lettering, it goes, it runs pretty much the whole gamut. Um, and so it's comprehensive, but it, it can't drill down super deep on any one point. And, and that book was really well received. Um, very proud. It won an industry, a, a pretty nice industry award called the Eagle Award uh, for the best book about comics. And then, th so the one I'm working on now is, here's, I just got the cover in the other day, so it's just a print out of it. But um, I don't know if you can see that real mm -hmm. well, but so that'll be coming out next year. But that one really is a drill down. That one's, you know, if you just sort of took one chapter of the previous book, well, now that chapter has been fleshed out into an entire book of its own. Um, and I go into a lot of, I, I'm able to get into some real nuts and bolts. Like how do you write a really effective panel description? What are the different kinds of panel descriptions? How much do you want to talk? to your artist in terms of incorporating like film language like close up or over the shoulder shot or what have you so I can really get and I can go off into some things that are really interesting I talk about um, like narrator voices um, all kinds of stuff that, that you can't cover quite in a six week course or um, or you know I, I certainly didn't have space to get to into the into the insider's guidebook so so it, it, it afforded me this opportunity and I read a ton of books on the comics industry. I mean, in a bookcase behind me, you can't see it, but there's like three shelves of books on comics back there. And this was a book that I felt like I'd seen the book that I would have wanted. Like if I were really trying to learn how to write comics, I've seen that book that's all nuts and bolts. I've read some great books about writing comics, don't get me wrong, but they never did what this one does I felt like for the most part they tend to talk about why we write they talk about character they talk about story and a lot of that stuff you can get elsewhere that do because you do clearly need it but I really get into the mechanics of the script writing and how to use things for dramatic effect and I feel like a lot of the other comics writing books don't don't go that deep into it and so once I realized that they were open to the page count allow me to go that deep I was I was pretty much on board at that point. It's, it's interesting that you say that because I, I've got a number of books at home uh, about comics and, and a lot of them are art books, but a few on, on writing. Um, and it's true, they never seem to get into uh, what you had mentioned before, the, the, the page turn panel. Um, and I was wondering um, if you could kind of explain to us, I spoke to Eric Larson recently about that and he said that you want the top panel uh, on the page to be sort of the the reveal and then the bottom panel is going to hook you to turn the page. So can you give us a little bit of, of what your philosophy is on that? Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty much the same. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the idea is that at the, at the bottom of the page, you, you know, I tend to talk about it in terms of want the reader to ask a question. 
question can be very simple as like, well, yeah, what do you think about that? So you, you can literally end it on a question, like a word balloon with a question. What do you want to have to lunch, want to have for lunch today? And then you turn the page to reveal she wants pizza today for lunch. You know, I mean, maybe not the most exciting hook, um, but there it is. But that's the principle of it is really just what can you do at the end of the page to propel your reader on to make them want to turn that page or go to the top of the next page and the reason why your top panel is the reveal is because comics being what they are you're scanning the whole page so if your reveal is panel there's a pretty good likelihood that it's spoiled and that sort of often would negate the purpose of the previous four panels um uh, Neil Gaiman wrote a book called 1602. I don't know if you remember that. I think it was eight issues long. And the climax of the sort of the climax panel of that series um, is, I think, the third panel on a page. And it's sort of a, uh, if I recall correctly, it's like a six panel grid. And the editor asked him if, if you want to do that, don't you want it to be you know a little bit bigger? And, and apparently Mr. Gaiman's response was no I want it to look like it's part of a mundane page because I don't want people to to see it like I don't want them to process that as a as a climax and so I thought that was I'm not sure that ultimately I I think that was a, the most effective way to do that in that in that series but what was interesting to me was that he had such a clear reason for why he was doing it that way and, and that's one of those stories that reminds me that while sometimes we'll use the word rule, we never really mean rule. You know, we, we really talk in terms of guidelines. Uh, for every rule we would make, there is a way that you can make it work not doing it that way or, or flat out breaking that rule and it can still work. And that's one of the exciting things about – that's not just for comics, you know, but that's true of any storytelling medium. And, and that's one of the exciting things about being a storyteller and about getting – you know, really getting into the work and 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 making those decisions that no one no one will ever know that that you like toiled over that decision, but it's it's still fun, you know, and it's still worth trying. It, it is interesting because if we were writing this as a screenplay, uh, it wouldn't matter um, how something happened within the scene; it would just sort of lead to the end of the scene, the the climactic moment in that scene. Uh, but in comics, you have you can have a scene that goes on for several pages, and and in each one, you need to have a series of cliffhangers to get the reader to turn to that next page. Yeah, these little mini cliffhangers. Um, yeah, that's that's true. Um, and I I would hes hesitate to say need, because I mean we can certainly write a three page scene that doesn't have little mini cliffhangers. Uh, it it is one of those things that that in the industry we tend to talk about, like you should do this. I I don't know that that. Uh, everybody feels that strongly about it. Um, I like it. I, one of the reasons I like it is because it keeps me honest. It keeps me focused and it, and it makes sure that at, l at least twice on a page, I'm really thinking about what the reader's experiencing, um, which is, which I find is very valuable to, to, to be reminded about, okay, so how is this coming across the reader? What's the reader think? What information does the reader get here? Um, you know how can I how can I manipulate my reader honestly to uh, you know feel sadness or to feel angry or scared or 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 what have you and you have sorts of abilities in in the various media but but they but they the way you would execute them is different and and like you were saying in comics this the idea of the cliffhanger or the or the question at the end of the page that doesn't make sense for TV or film um, it doesn't make sense for a novel either because page turn changes if you just alter the font by a point size. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, that is one of those things that, that is fairly unique to, to comics and right next to each other makes for, for a lot of, a lot of, um, there's a lot, such a simple concept that you've got images that are next to each other and theoretically they're in sequence, um, hence sequential art, but the very nature of the fact that you have more than one image on a page together, our minds as the reader are going to start drawing connections, even if they don't exist. If I just take three completely random photographs and put them on a table in a line next to each other and say, Hey, what do you see? Or what do you think's going on here? You're going to look at them and your mind telling the story of how they relate to each other. Um, and so, so once you start to realize kind of what the reader is going through, then you can really get into 
uh, manipulate, manipulating your story so that you're really driving the experience that the reader is having. Um, and that's a, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. And there, there are a lot of things that we're aware of, you know, there's, a, there's some that are, that we're aware of that are easy to sort of pick out in TV and film things like if you want to want somebody to look big and imposing or strong, then you film, you put your camera down and you look at up at them and they bring over you, you know, it's, it's those things. And, and you can, you can make it subtle or you can make it over the top, but each medium has those those uh, techniques to rely on to to manipulate, you know, what your reader's going through. It's it's funny. Uh, I often tell my students that, you know, you have to sort of understand the rules in order to break them. Uh, and it seems that you could in the in the writing a script, you could um, in writing visuals, you can try and make someone seem powerful, but perhaps suggest the visuals could be another way. And we only have a, about three minutes left before we run out of time. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, writing sure. a, a visual. Um, for an artist. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, well, it's a little bit different for an illustration versus writing for a comic. So we call them panel descriptions when, when we're talking about, you know, you're writing page 15 and there are five images on that page and uh, be panels through five. Um, and the, the key to writing panel descriptions for an artist, because this is storytelling for a straight illustration, I could describe basically what I see in my mind. Uh, uh, it's a little different in in comics because what you really want to do is is tell your artist what the action is that what is the the story beat if you want to use the term or really what the action is in that panel. One of the reasons why I focus on it being an ad is because you don't want a passive panel. A passive panel is essentially a wasted panel, and an action could be hesitation. You know, a, a, a hesitation could be an action. You know, but um, but that way you're not saying to the artist, position this character on the left, position this character on the right. I want the camera positioned here, looking down. What you're saying is Superman grabs Lex Luthor by the, by the shirt. How that is depicted is really up to the artist. And sometimes if you're trying to do a particularly complex where you kind of want it to seem like there's a camera like panning and so one panel you see this then you see this certainly talk to your artist one of the nice things about a comic script is that you have the ability to sort of have a little conversation you know i tend to write uh my own scripts in a fairly concise way because i don't want to add layers of information that aren't helpful and can be confusing um but i also do it in a conversational way so i'm really talking with my artist uh, Andy Schmidt, I'd like to thank you for being on Comic Culture. If you're interested in learning more, please visit comicsexperience.com. I'd like to thank you at home for watching. We'll see you again soon.